Okay. So I work on the LZ Dark Matter experiment, which is deployed underground in uh, South Dakota. It's the world's largest and best star, uh, dark matter experiment. So I'm I'm an astroparticle physicist. Okay, can you explain what that dark ex dark matter experiment is and how it works? Sure. So I should probably start by explaining what dark matter itself is. So it's a hypothetical form of matter that we are very, very sure exists because we have indirect evidence, observational evidence from astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology, primarily through gravity. So we know there's more matter than we can see, and we know it's not made of the same um, particles, constituents as ordinary matter. And so one of the ways to look for dark matter is you actually make, you create particle detectors, you deploy them deep underground because the idea is dark matter would pass through the earth unimpeded like neutrinos and similar uh, particles and interact with your detector. So in the LZ detector, we use a gigantic bucket basically, or it's a thermos actually, the formal term is cryostat of liquid xenon. So xenon's very good element because it produces light when um, external particles interact with it. And so you get flashes of light whenever you have external particles, external radiation interact with the, with the xenon. So we have this uh, deployed about almost a mile underground in South Dakota. Wow, are there any images of this we can see? Like that gives you like a good, how, how big is it? Absolutely. So it's a it's ten it's ten ton scale liquid xenon detector. It's about um, I'm a scientist, so I use meters. So just multiply by oh, three no. for feet, or just pretend <laughs> I'm saying yards. So it's like one and a half meters. Is high. it similar to yards? Are meters and yeah, yards? Yeah, yeah, okay. extremely similar. So it's one and a half meters tall by one and a half meters wide, roughly. But that's inside of a of a water tank and several other layers of shielding because we want to be sure if we have a detection mm -hmm. that it's dark matter, not something else. So it has a lot of layers of shielding. So actually, we've got some images coming up right. Oh, now. Wow. So you can see the diagram from Smithsonian there. There's a um, uh, there's a diagram of how it works right there. So an, a particle comes in, produces a flash of light, as well as loosens some electrons off of the atom. So we actually get two signals. First, a flash of light, a uh, primary flash of light in the mm -hmm. liquid, and then a secondary flash of light up top um, from, the, uh, from the electrons that got ripped out. So the time between the two signals gives us the depth of the event, and the hit pattern of the light gives us the radial position. So we have three-dimensional position reconstruction of any incoming particles that interact with the detector. And what does this tell you specifically about dark matter? Well, we're looking for something extra beyond the ordinary particles that are gonna constantly interact like just gamma rays and just betas and radiation from the environment. So we're looking for something extra that is going to be above the constant noise of the regular, you know, old school particles we know and love. So here's a picture of the actual experiment. It's actually made of, uh, it's white because it's made of Teflon because Teflon actually reflects ultraviolet light. And so that helps bounce the light into the photo sensors at the top and the bottom. So we're hoping that a particle of dark matter comes in, bumps into an atom of xenon, and makes a flash of light that we can detect reproducibly. How many particles of dark matter have you seen? None. None yet. No, so when I say we're the world's best dark matter experiment, it's because we've measured zero better than anybody else. <laughs> so we actually, you know, you would, you would hear about it from the mainstream media if we had actually made a discovery. Because we This would be a front page of material, huh? It, potentially, just like the gravitational waves discovery was with LIGO a few years ago. So it would be a big deal. So dark matter is just a theory. Um, that word is misused. So in science, theory means fact. So the phrase just a theory is one of those things that like raises like my skin because there's no such thing. So a theory in science means incontrovertible fact. The Theory? Yes. When other people, when non-scientists use the word theory, they mean hypothesis. Ah. So dark oh, matter is a very well-established theory in the sense that even though we don't have direct evidence, we have so many mountains of observational evidence mm. that very few people doubt that there's something there. Got it. So for now, it's just a hypothesis. Yeah, well, it's kind of in a gray area towards theory because it's got so much indirect evidence in its favor. So it's sort of like people will refer to it as a dark matter theory. Mm -hmm. I prefer hypothesis because we don't have conclusive observation in the lab yet. And isn't it, isn't it, don't we, don't we also have another hypothesis that dark matter has mass to it? 
Oh, no, that's that's guaranteed. Oh, that's guaranteed. That's that not it has mass. separate. It has to have mass because otherwise and, it can't produce gravity. And that was because when we observed galaxies, we noticed that the center of the galaxy has the same spin rate as the rim of the galaxy, meaning that there's like mass that's flattening the spin rate. Is that no, not close? quite. Okay. Not quite. So at, at high radius, there's a flattening when there should be a dropping off. So, for example, take a, a Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune yeah. is going to be orbiting the sun more slowly than the Earth. Okay, that's just a natural consequence of the law of gravity. farther away. Yes. However, what we see in galaxies is that the farther out you go, we didn't see that drop off. And that's been attempted to be explained without dark matter, without additional mass. There are theories of modified gravity, but the vast majority really don't work because they can't explain why, for example, you have galaxies apparently that we've discovered over the last several years that seem to be 100%, almost 100% dark matter and 0%. So that really implies that dark matter is stuff and you can so, have more stuff and less stuff. So the farther out you get into the galaxy, the stuff is spinning at the same speed as the stuff that's close to the galaxy. Yeah, in, instead of dropping off, which would be natural. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, so it builds up. So there's slow speeds at the center. Mm -hmm. Then it builds up because you've got more mass essentially underneath you effectively. Mm -hmm. And so you, the speed builds up, but it, there should be a peak and then a drop off. But we don't see that expected drop off that's predicted from both Newtonian mechanics as well as relativity. And dark matter is just like... a theoretically all around us and it's just the invisible stuff that we don't see because it's electromagnetically indetectable right like so dark matter would be all around us right now Te that's right oh, that's right okay. it's in this room well that it also depends on the number density we don't know what the number density is so dark matter individual dark matter particles might be very rare we think we know the average energy density but we don't know like how many dark matter particles are there per unit volume necessarily mm. what we do you only guess that what are your thoughts on um the john wheeler it from bit stuff oh you mean how everything is is like one, ones and zeros and like the dark matter is like computation like a computational uh, i you know cloud of ones and zeros like adam like a, the idea is everything is a is a yes or no right if you if you like boil everything down atoms and protons and neutrons down mm -hmm. to, to everything it could be it could be binary bits right is that basically what it from bit is uh yeah but i completely disagree because okay. with quantum mechanics you have something in between zero and one. That's the whole point behind qubits in quantum computers is that you have more than just zero and one now for the first time. Uh. And so I, I, I think that um, it's interesting speculation and philosophy, uh -huh. but also I'm an experimental physicist. I don't like, I want to know what, what testable prediction can an idea make? If an idea doesn't have a testable prediction, then it's not a scientific theory. Uh, John Wheeler did a lot of excel excellent science, mm -hmm. outstanding, but he also did a lot of philosophizing, kind of you know metaphysics. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But if you don't have a testable oh. prediction, I don't. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm agnostic towards something. I don't know what to think about. Yeah, it. I don't know how you would test yeah. that. Yeah. And you're, so, so you're saying quantum quantum computing would render that irrelevant or render that. well he'd probably disagree because he'd say well it's still bits all the way down but the thing is mm -hmm. with quantum computing you have the ability to have um indeterminate states okay. it is true that once you make a measurement everything is still spin up or spin down zero or one but you also have the indeterminate states that exist prior to measurements you know schrodinger's cat and all that stuff so mm -hmm. so that's why i'm not really comfortable with that over simplistic assessment i would say that everything is zeros and and ones because i think um we're ignoring what fractions you know we're ignoring you know rational irrational numbers you know pi is the irrational number it's not zero or one so i just think that's kind of an oversimplification and the world is a lot more nuanced a lot a lot of supposed theories of everything really like grossly oversimplify the world into one sentence and miss a lot of the the nuances hard to explain with some of the like simplistic ideas yeah.